Um, my addictive personality usually comes in spurts, but there is uh, one addiction that has lasted the test of time. My name's Daniel, and I'm an appleholic. It all started in high school when I got my first iPhone. I was a senior, and suddenly the entire world opened up to me. I now had the internet at my fingertips. And then came the MacBook, and then the iPad, then the watch, a few more iPhones along the way, then the TV. If they ever come out with toilet paper, I'm buying it. I am helplessly addicted to Apple. Is there anybody else in my camp, Apple addicts? A couple of us, okay. How, how many people, just for, for help, how many people have iPhones? Okay, good amount. Android people, raise your hand. Keep those up. Father, please forgive them. <laughs> they know not what they are doing, and they're ignorant. No, I'm kidding. Uh, now, I asked this at the 8 o'clock, and there were a couple, so I'm going to see if there's any in the younger crowd. Uh, does anyone have a non-smartphone? We have one. Can we give a couple, a few, round of applause? Um, the, the, I, I've heard them called dumb phones before. I think that's just wrong because I think they're smarter than we are who have smartphones. I love my iPhone because I can do so much with it. One of my favorite updates that they came out with a few years ago is a little app. And parents, if you didn't know about this app, uh, this is going to be all you need today and you're going to go home blessed. There is an app called Find My Friends. Okay? So what happens is that you can share your location with somebody. So parents, if your son or daughter has an iPhone, no matter what they say, they can share their location with you. And then you can pull up this nice little map and you can see where everybody is. So I can see that my wife uh, is just over there in that building. I can see my mother-in-law's down there in Houston. Um, somebody just asked to share my location. Who was that? <laughs> no, whoever it was. We've got Garrett Glasser, one of our college students. He's down in Katy. I love this because I can always know where people are. This has saved me so much time, right? Because before this app came out, I, I would call my wife all the time, and I had to actually ask her where she was at spending money. I couldn't just look up on the phone. I had to call, where, where are you? What are you doing? How much? And, and now it's so much easier than that. I love this app because I love knowing where other people are. And as I think about that app, I think that we as church people can be a lot like that as well. That we love to know where other people are. We love to know the location of others. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you've come to church for any period of time, then you've probably looked down the pew or across the table at somebody and you said, man, that person has the kind of faith that I want. They, they know their Bible, they pray, they serve, they raise their kids so well. We, we see that location is where I want to be. Or we say things like, well, yeah, they come to church, but did you see what they posted on Facebook? We say, yeah, I, I think that they're a Christian, but have you heard how they run their business? Yeah, I, I know that they know some stuff about the Bible, but did you see how they acted in traffic? Did you see that gesture they made? We're really good at looking at others' location, and Jesus understands this as well. This is when he tells the story of the log and the speck. He says, who are you to talk about the speck in somebody else's eye when you have a log in your own eye? In other words, he's saying, don't just look at other people's location, but locate yourself. And so, uh, this next two weeks, this week we're going to locate ourselves. As I began praying about this series, I, it became very um, apparent to me how difficult it is to preach to everyone at our church. Not because you're that difficult people, though some of you are, but it's difficult because we have nearly 4,000 members. We'll see 1,200 people on a weekend. And of all of those people, we're all on vastly different journeys. We're in different pots along the way. And so it's hard for somebody to stand up here and preach a message to everyone, right? Jerry has many, 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 many more years of experience than me. He's the old guy, remember? He has so many more years of experience than me that he's quite good at that. He knows how to cater to everyone. Uh, but even if he or I or Tommy have preached a sermon and you've said, man, that didn't really hit me, chances are it hit the person next to you. And the reason it hits different ones of us is because we're all on different paths along the same journey. We're all in different stages. 
So when we talk about this, this churchy word called discipleship, it, it's a path. It's a journey that we're all on. You'll see the biblical authors refer to it in this way all the time. That's why the early Christians were called the way. Jesus calls out to his disciples. He says, follow me. It's this idea of being on a journey. Jesus doesn't call us like little lap dogs and say, hey, believe in me and then sit and stay. Instead, we're hunting dogs. And what does a hunting dog do? A hunting dog follows after their master and seeks out. And so on this journey the biblical authors have written down for us, we see that we're all in different places. And what I'm going to challenge you to do this morning is to locate yourself. Don't just find your friends, but find your faith. Don't just look at where others are, but ask yourself deep inside, where am I? And then next week, based off of kind of where you're at, we're going to talk about how to grow how to take that next step along the journey. So if you won't be here next week, uh, check it out online, or if you weren't planning to come, now you should, because it'll make a whole lot more sense next week than it does at the end of today. But today we're going to talk about the importance of knowing your own location, of knowing where you're at along the faith journey. And to do that, we're going to look at a story that Jesus told about two men, one of which knows their location, and the other doesn't. It's Luke chapter 18, and I'll start in verse 9. Jesus told this parable to some, listen to this, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. In other words, these are the people who are really good at locating themselves and comparing them to others. They're good at looking at another person and saying, well, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I'm not that bad of a sinner. Well, yeah, I, I do this, but at least I don't do that. Yeah, I, I may have a log in my eye, but instead I'm going to look at the speck. So Jesus tells this parable. Two men go up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a tax collector. So these are common characters in the, in the biblical text. Uh, a Pharisee would have been the righteous one. This is someone who has devoted their life to learning about God and serving in his ways. So... so I, he may not be addicted to apple, he's addicted to righteousness. The scriptures will tell us that they, they tithe everything, including their cinnamon, all of their spices they tithe. They want to do everything they can to be righteous. This would have been the hero. But then we're told there's another man, a tax collector, a dirty IRS agent. And, and back in these days, this wasn't just taking too much taxes. It was taking too much taxes, stealing some more, and then giving it to an evil empire called Rome. So already we have the stage set of a hero and a bad guy. But look what happens. The Pharisee standing by himself, if you're too righteous, chances are you don't have a lot of friends. Standing by himself prayed this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Then he brags to God, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector who was standing far off would not even lift his eyes to the heavens. But instead he beat his breast and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He knows his location. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. What's happened here is that the biggest difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector is that the tax collector knows his own location. He's able to have an honest conversation with God and say, I'm a sinner. And so he becomes the hero of the story. He goes down to his house justified. And I love this because in all of Jesus' stories, the hero is unlikely. When you hear the story, you think, surely it's the church guy, it's the religious guy that's going to come out the hero, not the dirty tax collector. But Jesus has a way of taking the most unlikely, the most downtrodden, the least suspecting person and making them a hero. A tax collector, a woman caught in adultery, children, lepers, people who are hurting, who are sick, who are far away from God. Jesus turns them into the heroes. And this tax collector is a hero because he knows his own location. 
And his location is the same as all of ours. And it's this broad category that we call sinner. I know we're Methodists. We don't talk like this, but let's get real. We're all sinners. Romans 3 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's our status in front of God. If you feel guilty about being a sinner, it's okay because we all are. But underneath that category of sinner, we're all in different paths and different stages along the journey. God is calling us in, forgiving us of our sins, showing us his love, showing us his grace, and then pushing us out. And so what I want to do in the remaining time we have together this morning is identify three broad stages. These are stages that came from my own small brain. So if you don't like them, save your email. I know they're not perfect. But throughout history, Christian thinkers and theologians and writers and authors have been trying to plot out different stages along the way. Our own Wesleyan heritage is Methodist. John Wesley was all about kind of the methods. That's why we're called Methodists, the spiritual disciplines that allow you to grow deeper into who Christ is. Two more disclaimers and then we'll get going. The first disclaimer is this. These stages are linear, but they're not. They're linear, but they're not. So, so when we think about stages, I, I think of uh, things like getting a job promotion or being in the military or going off to college. And you know that if you do the right things and you shake the right hands and you stay out of trouble, that you automatically go kind of from one stage to the other, to the other, to the other. And it's very linear. When it comes to walking with Christ, it's not that simple. I wish that it was. But, but sometimes you'll start in stage one, you'll go to two, and you'll go to three, and it'll be a natural progression. But more than likely, you'll start at one, you'll go to two, you'll step back into one, you'll maybe skip ahead to three for a brief moment, you go back to two. It's not as simple as it sounds. The other thing is that as I'm going through these stages, you're likely going to fit into all of them in some respects. You'll kind of see bits and pieces and say, yeah, I'm, I'm like that, but I'm also like that, but I'm working on that. And that's okay. We're all unique and, and God created people who aren't going to fit into one particular peg. That's okay. These are just broad categories. The second disclaimer is this. And it's so important. Salvation happens at the start of stage one. Salvation happens at the start of stage one. I want to be abundantly clear about this. We believe that we are saved by grace through faith and faith alone. That means that no matter how hard you try, no matter how many good works you do, no matter how deep you are into the spiritual disciplines, you're not going to make God save you and you're not going to make God love you more. We believe that salvation is a gift and all we have to do is to receive it. That happens at the start of stage one. Then the stages are for your good. Because I believe that God has given us a way to live life. He's given us laws and rules and regulations about the created order. And if we live into those godly ways, we can live the abundant life that he says he has brought to us. If we just put ourselves on autopilot, come to church every once in a while, we may be uplifted when the sermon's good. We may be stirred by some music occasionally, but we're not going to live the abundant life that Christ comes to offer us. And that's what this stage is all about. So there in your notes, stage number one is a stage, they're gonna rhyme, you're welcome. Stage number one is called knowing, knowing. And there's a biblical concept, there's this biblical idea of infancy. Uh, of when Jesus says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he, he says, you must be born again. And then the later biblical authors kind of stole that metaphor and borrowed it. And, and Paul will say things to the Corinthians like, you don't need solid food, you need milk. It's this idea that when we find Christ, when we have a great experience of knowing him, that we are newborns in the faith. And so this stage there in your notes is all about loving Jesus all about loving Jesus. I love being around stage one knowers. They are passionate. They are excited. They want to know more about Christ. They want to serve him. They have zeal and they have excitement and they are just charged up and ready to live the Christian life. And I love it. Uh, if you don't have those kinds of people in your life, uh, go check out youth on Sunday evening. 
uh, and see the excitement, see the passion, see the zeal that those young believers have for Jesus Christ. It's all about loving him, about growing in him, about teaching him, and, and just being in that place that they want to be with him. This often happens after a powerful experience. Maybe people have a, a near-death experience and, and then realize that God's gift is life. Maybe for you, when you were in this stage, it was because you heard a great sermon or you attended some event or some retreat and your heart was strangely warmed and you knew that you knew that you knew that God's grace was for you. And so you asked him into your heart and you were newborn again into the faith and you were a knower. I love knowers because they are so excited. But I will say that for some church people, and I hand up on this, I'm, I'm a church person. For some people, knowers can become a nuisance. Knowers can become a nuisance. Well, what do I mean by that? I mean that for somebody who's new to the faith, whether they're old or young, when they come into the flock, when they come into the church, we sort of have um, a code of conduct here that we don't publish, but we all sort of know, right? And so a new believer is going to come in and not know that code of conduct. So we know things like uh, what to wear. We know things like which e entrance to come into to be closest to the coffee. It's that one. We know when Missy's going to put out cookies in the Connection Center. We know that even though this service starts at 930, it doesn't really start till 945, right? <laughs> and then we have a language that early knowers don't understand. We say things like vacation Bible school which sounds like a lot of fun, and it is for the kids. We say things like stewardship. And if you've been a part of a church for a long time, you know stewardship means money. We have our own way of talking and of doing and of being. And when people come in who don't have that frame of reference, they can feel like a nuisance. Maybe you've had a person like this in your small group or in your Sunday school class. And they come in and they're excited about the Lord, but we can get a little crusty. I say, hey, calm down, calm down. Jesus didn't really mean that. Calm down, we're, we're, we're going to get to that later. Or they begin to ask questions, good, passionate questions that we don't have answers to. They be, can become a little bit of a nuisance. When it comes to knowers, though, I treat newborn Christians like I treat newborn babies in the church. And it was some advice given to me by my grandfather, who was a Methodist pastor. And he always said, if there's a baby crying in worship, let him cry. He said, the sound of a crying baby in a church is a sign that God is not done with us yet. It's a sign that God is raising up the next generation of believers here in his house. He said, let the babies cry. Because when you have crying babies, it's a sign of a healthy church. So church, even though these knowers, these new Christians, don't fit exactly into the mold we want to fit them into, we need them. If you're a knower, we need you. We need to borrow your passion, your excitement for where we've got crusty. We need your zeal. We need your passion. It's a sign of a growing and a healthy church. Last thing I want to say about this stage is that there's a temptation to never leave the knowing stage. There's a temptation to never leave the knowing stage. What do I mean by that? I mean, when you're loving Jesus when you have a powerful experience, when you just want to grow and serve and worship him, you're seeking after an experience a lot of the times. You're seeking after that, that, that feeling you had at the walk to Emmaus or at your church camp or at a Billy Graham crusade, crusade. You're seeking after that. And chances are you're not gonna find it week in and week out. So a lot of these knowers will start coming to church. They're excited, they're ready to go and they come and they come and they come and they're really consistent for a couple of months and then they fade off. They still have Jesus in their hearts. They still have faith in Christ. But what happens is that when they don't have the experience that they want, they begin to fade out. And then we see them on Christmas and Easter. There's a lot of religious people who have been walking the journey of faith for a long time, but they haven't really been walking it. They've been staying still in this first stage. Because moving from this first stage of knowing into the second stage of growing takes work. It takes work. 
Paul says to work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. And to take that step from stage one to stage two, it takes work. It takes effort. The stage two, the the early mystics would call this uh, purgation. The biblical authors refer to this as young adulthood. And this is a time where you are growing in your faith. You've had the powerful experience. You're still excited about Jesus Christ. But now you realize that your faith is going to take some work. So this stage is all about learning about Jesus. The first stage was about loving him. This one's all about learning about him. And if I had to venture to guess, I would say the vast majority of us at this church are probably in this stage two of growing. Where we're growing in our knowledge of God. We're not just reading our Bibles for information, but we're reading them to know how we can apply it. They don't just read for information, they read for application. And so what happens is that growers will look at the life of Jesus. Then they'll look at their own life and they'll begin to say, how do I bring us closer together? They'll get rid of sins. Things that they've been doing for decades that now they realize with Christ in their heart that they shouldn't be doing it. The big stuff and the little stuff. They gain head knowledge, but really what they gain is heart knowledge. They realize that yes, Jesus' ways are higher, they are better. He created me so he knows what's best for me. So I'm gonna stop doing this and I'm gonna start doing that. They grow in grace. Usually people in this, uh, in this stage, they'll, they'll join the church, right? We, we still believe in church membership, it's important. Why? Because it's making a covenant with the community. It says, hey, I'm going to show up and I'm going to worship and I'm going to support the church by my prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And then we as a congregation said, you're a part of our family now and we're going to look after you. People in the second stage, they get that. They join a small group. They start serving. They may even do something crazy and sign up for vacation Bible school. Another pitch. Do it. It's not that bad. You get a nap at the end of the day. They've gone from the passionate zeal and now they begin to put roots in. And most of the time, this is where I self-identify with. This is kind of the stage that I feel most often that I'm in, is in this growing stage where I'm learning, where I'm applying, where I'm trying to get there, where I'm moving along the path that I'm putting in the work, but I'm not quite at that third stage yet. If stage one is knowing and stage two is growing, stage three, you can, this is a choose your own adventure. It's either sowing or showing. I couldn't decide on one. So it's either sowing or showing. It's the same idea. The people in this third stage are uh, the saints of the church. I have met very few of these stage threeers that don't have gray hair or no hair at all. They've walked a journey. They've been through it all. And we can look across the pews or across the table and see these people and see, wow, their faith. They don't just know their scriptures, but they teach them. They don't just know about Jesus, but they live like Jesus. The stage is all about living like Jesus. And it's not forced. We say here at the church that our mission is to make disciples who make disciples. And embedded in that mission statement is this idea that we want to produce stage three Christians. We don't just want you to come and to consume, to to be uplifted every Sunday morning. We want you to come and be so transformed by the grace of Jesus Christ that you want to transform others. We want you to sow those seeds. We want you to show the love in you and not have it be forced. These stage three people understand that. They look, they act, they seek Jesus. This is what John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he talked about perfectionism. This was kind of the biggest uh, theological debate that we have within Wesleyanism. And he said that when Jesus said, be ye perfect as I am perfect, that Jesus was being serious. And so what Wesley said is that at the end of all these stages is something called perfectionism. And there's different ideas about what exactly he meant, whether you could be free from all willing sin or all sin, or whether you could be perfectly united in love. But the basic idea was this. We should all have some goal that we're reaching for. If we don't know where we're going, it's hard to get there. And so he said just the very idea that there is a way to be perfected in love on this earth should push us beyond stage one and stage two into stage three. These are the people that we want our church filled with, but it takes a long time to get there. 
Because when you look at this person, you see their passion and their zeal and their Christ-likeness. And you may say, I want that. But when you see how great of a Christian they are, here's what you don't see. You don't see that divorce they went through. You don't see that child that they lost. You don't see those financial troubles that only by the grace of God they got through. All you see is someone who seems like they have it all together. And what I love about stage three people is when you ask them, they probably won't identify themselves here. They probably won't say, oh yeah, I'm a stage three or why? Because I fully believe that the closer you are to Jesus, the further you feel. The closer you are to Jesus, the further you feel. Some of the most on-fire Christians I have ever met seem and say that they are so far and still have so far yet to go. But one preacher calls the paradox of progress. This idea that once we learn more about Jesus and once we try to apply his message to our own lives, we realize how far we have to go. But all along the way, we're, we're getting blessed by it. We're seeing, yes, Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And each step we take along the way gets us closer and closer and closer to that abundant life that he's offering us. There's a last stage, there's a bonus stage that really comes before the first stage. I want to talk uh, for a moment here um, to the people in this stage that I call the seeking stage. It doesn't rhyme. I understand that. I apologize. The seeking stage. And these are people who have maybe heard a rumor about abundant life, who have heard something about Jesus, but really haven't put their faith in him. And listen, I, I'm very aware that there are probably multiple seekers here today. And I'm glad that you're here. Maybe you got drugged here and maybe you don't want to be here. Maybe you just came for the free air conditioning, but we're glad that you're here. And let me say this. You may have not ever realized it, but what you're seeking after is Jesus Christ. Here's what I mean. There is no worldly system. There is no political party. There is no philosophical idea. There is no self-help book that can help you find meaning and purpose. Sure, it may work for a time. Sure, you may wake up and think that you know what your life is all about, but ultimately all of those systems fail. What you're seeking after in your meaning, in your purpose, in unconditional love is the abundant life that Jesus Christ brings. And the good news is that you don't have to seek after him. God's not lost. God is seeking after you. It's no accident you're here this morning. It didn't just happen by some stars aligning that you are in this room now seeking after answers. It's going to be oversimplified, but your answer is Jesus Christ. And it's as simple as receiving the grace that he's given to you. Say, yes, God, I am a sinner. I get that. I do things I shouldn't. I say things I shouldn't. I think things I shouldn't. But I thank you that in Jesus Christ, his free grace that he gives to us, he lived and died that I might have a share of that inheritance. And I tell you, once you start along the journey, you'll find that meaning. You'll find that purpose. You'll find that wholeness that your heart is seeking after. And it all starts with a simple call that he's giving to stage one, stage two, stage three, and even the seekers. The call is the same for all of us. Jesus says, come, follow me. God, I thank you that 